Boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got Big Joe Egan. How are you, brother? James, thank you. Great to be here, Paul. Yeah, absolute pleasure for coming on the show, mate. Pleasure you've got mine. a great story. Pal's retiring for 30-odd years. 38 years now, yeah. and counting. Um, boxing career yourself, acting career. Do you know something? It's it's surreal what's happening to me at the moment, James. I Each day I keep thinking, life can't get any better, and then mm -hmm. suddenly you get off another movie role, and it's getting better and constantly yeah. improving all the time. But my, my, my boxing career, um, I started boxing originally because of bullies. Mm -hmm. I got bullied as a child. And if you speak to most fighters, most fighters have that similar start, you know, down to bullying. And my dad worked on the building sites in England, and we came over to visit him as kids, my brothers and sisters. And I got bullied when I came to England because I had the Irish accent. So I picked up the English accent. And when I went home to Dublin, I got bullied in Dublin because I had the English accent. All my years boxing, only I've had one tooth knocked out. I got two teeth knocked out on the day I made my Holy Communion in Manchester. Um, the bully boys tried to take my Holy Communion medal. I held on to my medal and they knocked out my two front teeth. So I learned how to, to box. I learned how to stand up for myself and I learned how to fight. Originally, like I said, just to stand up against the bullies. And I could take a beating off the bullies. I took some savage beating off bullies. When the bullies had finished beating on me, rather than hit my brothers and sisters, I used to jump back in. I said, don't hit them, hit me. You know, so I could absorb punishment like a sponge. And most of the time when the bullies are hitting you, there's a gang of them, you know, like pack animals. And um, the boxer, yeah, that's just, yeah, most bullies are cowards. I don't condone bullying in any shape or form. You know, people think it just happens as a child, it happens as adults as well. And it's sad really what's happening now because when, when I got bullied as a kid, I got phys physically bullied. And you could make it home when you had your safe haven, you close your front door. Kids are now getting bullied in the home by cyberbullying internet and social yeah. media, you know, and so there's no real safe haven. But I learned how to box and I learned how to defend myself. And I became okay to tell you the truth. I went on and won seven Irish boxing titles, which was, a, to win one Irish title was a major achievement, you know, for me. And then to win seven, I won four seniors, two under 19s and a junior title. And I boxed for Ireland many times. I left school when I was young. I was on the, I left school when I was 14 years of age. I didn't want to study. I just wanted to box. Yeah. And I thought boxing was going to be my livelihood. I wasn't very academic. I'm the eldest of seven. I've got four sisters and two brothers. But one of my sisters became a chartered accountant, so there is brains in the family. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, uh, she um, she makes me very proud. All my brothers and sisters make me proud. Anyway, How was your upbringing? It was hard. My dad worked all over the world. He's a concrete worker. I worked down in America for oh, 40 years. My dad's out in, out in uh, New York. He worked all over, the, all over Europe, concrete and building bridges, dams, skyscrapers. So we never saw a lot of him, to tell you the truth. My mum, she brought us up, really, and uh, she's done a good job. You know, there's a um, lot to be proud of. We've all done okay. My brother's a milkman. He's, he's, he's got his, his milk business. Uh, my sister came out to America. She married a, a policeman in New York. They live in North Carolina. Now he's retired from the police. And mother sister's an accountant. Um, mother brother works for Jaguar Land Rover. So we've all done okay, yeah. you know, and they've all got kids. I've got no children. Um yeah, so my mum done a good job. When my mum and dad, my dad could come home, you know, when we had time off work or when we could go and visit him, we'd, we'd, we'd have a good catch-up. Yeah. It was a hard-working man. So your amateur career, you, had, you won 80 fights, is that correct? I had uh, 105 amateur fights, uh -huh. I won 87, I yeah. lost 18. But the 18 I lost, I lost to some good fighters, you know, and... Steve Collins, one of those Oh, fighters? Steve Collins, my first ever amateur fight. Yeah. Oh, was he? Yeah, first, I was a... Uh, world 11. champion, Steve Collins. He went on to win two yeah. world titles. Good friend of mine, Steve. Mm -hmm. I was at both his weddings. Great fight, And a huh? uh, tough, tough man, the Celtic warrior. Yeah. I, um, I boxed Steve. I was 11 years of age, and he was 12 and a half. So when you're 11, that year like and a half makes a big difference. Yeah. And I've been so used to going along to tournaments, trying to get a fight as a spare because of my size from my age. Like, I was big for 11. So it was very difficult to get any boys my age. But they allowed my size difference to Steve's size difference because of the year and a half age difference. And I, I'd met him outside. It was in the... Um, Phoenix Amateur Boxing Club, and I was going up to the door, and there's a friend of mine outside, Skinner Evans, and he was standing there. And hey, Skinner, how you doing? He goes, you're boxing? Yeah, I'm boxing today. He said, who are you boxing? I said, I don't know, but I'm going to punch the head of him. I was so <laughs> full confidence of him. And uh, I was a confident kid. But this fellow was standing behind, behind uh, Skinner Evans. And I said, you boxing? He goes, yeah. I said, well, the best of luck to you. And that was Steve Collins. And I didn't know he was the kid who was boxing. So next of all, I'm in the ring, and I'm looking. I thought, I recognize his face. It was this, I'd seen him outside. 
Anyway, the first round, I got hammered. I got battered. And I've come back to my corner. The referee at the time was a man called Lugs Brannigan, Mr. Brannigan. He was called Lugs because of his big ears. He was a policeman. And they used to joke about Lugs saying he was a one-man riot squad. And he was a tough, tough man. And I didn't want to quit. I didn't want to be retired on my stool. I thought the referee will stop the fight if I'm getting too badly beaten. But Lugs thought everybody was as tough as him. And he let me take a pace in for three rounds. And Steve beat me. But there was no shame when you look at what he went on to achieve. I boxed him again when I was 16 and he was 17 and a half. He beat me again. But it was an honour to share the ring with him. Every fighter that climbs into the ring dreams about becoming a champion of the world. I wasn't good enough to become a champion of the world. I fought lots of world champions and I sparred lots of world champions. And it was an honour, like I said, to share the ring with him. If you're going to get battered, you might as well get battered by the best. But you were quoted as one of the strongest men and the planet at one point were one of the most fiercest because you'd been up against guys like Lennox Lewis, Mike Tyson, and they never put you in your ass once. No, I'd always had a, an abundance of courage. You know, every fighter that climbs into the ring is a person of courage. There's women fighting now, so they're courageous. To walk to the ring and fight, you've got to have courage. And like I said earlier on, I learned how to fight by getting bullied. I learned how to hold my own against the bullies. I became, you know, reasonably tough. And in the boxing ring, there was only one man hitting you. Like I said, with the bullies, there was a gang in them hitting you. So you had a referee, you had a break in between rounds, you had the best medical care. You didn't have that luxury of getting bullied. You know, yeah. in the boxing ring, it was quite safe. And um, Did yeah, you I enjoy it at that I loved, stage? I loved the sport. Absolutely passionate about the sport. I adore the fighters. I admire the fighters. I respect. That's the great thing about boxing. Boxing, first and foremost, gives you self-respect. Then it gives you respect for other people. And that's the most important thing in life. If you haven't got respect, you've got nothing. Self-respect is so important, you know. And that's what boxing instills in people. It instills self-respect and yeah. respect for your opponent. You can see people punch lumps out of each other for 6, 8, 10, 12, the old 15 rounds, and then embrace at the end of that. Like a warmth of an embrace because they've earned each other's respect yeah. and that's what I love about the sport you know, I, I'm passionate how did about your it. relationship with Mike Tyson become about that well I'll tell you what happened right I left school like I said when I was 14 I was on the doors at 15 and I won Irish titles and I got picked, at 15 yeah I was on the doors yeah, I was, sake, I know, yeah. but I was big for my age James mm -hmm. I was how big, big for my age I was big I was weight? big I was heavy Ready? I was heavy yeah I've always been I've always fought the battle of the bulge you know I mm -hmm. love my food mm -hmm. you know I always joke about the people who say my, my favourite meal is seconds. I love, I love, I love, I love grub, you know. If I'm, not, if I'm not training, I go huge. Yeah. You know, so, um, yeah, I was on the door, but I, I, I could hold my own and I was, I was brave. Anyway, one night I was on the door and uh, I was working Jules Nightclub, I was 16 at this stage. It was Declan Foley, Johnny McIntyre and Johnny Nugent. And they were the other three doormen. And I was saying with the barriers, and I saw two of my old school teachers coming along, Mr. Cook and Jim Doherty. You could call Jim Jim, he was a physics teacher, it was cool. Mr. Cook was the English teacher. But they used to be trendy, wearing ripped denims and clogs and ponchos. And I've hid behind, I said, oh my God, they're my school teachers. I only left school like a year before, 18 yeah. months before. So I've hid. The doorman think I'm 21. So as Declan Foley stepped out to stop them because they weren't suitably dressed for the club, ripped denims and that, he said, I'm sorry, guys, this, the dress code and you're not welcome. Mr. Cook, very posh, he goes, well, school teachers, don't judge us by a retire. Next of all, I sort of look, the glance out. Next of all, he sees me. He goes, this is only a, a step there. He was going to say, it's a teenage disco. I stepped out, I pushed Declan Foley to the side. And I said, how you doing, Jim? I said, nice to see you. I said, it's all right, Declan. I said, these were my school teachers when I left school years ago, right? And I've ushered them in. And I said, what are you doing? I said, they think I'm 21. I said, I'm 16 now. I said, don't worry, mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, that's some good fun on the doors. But I was big for my age. Anyway, I won an Irish title at, uh, on the 19th, junior and senior in the one year. And I got picked to go out to America. And I fought in America, I fought a, a big American Marine side. I was only 17. I fought a big American Marine sergeant called William Dawson. He was 28, big, powerful man. I was only a boy, really. I hadn't got the man strength. But I had courage, and I took a beating, stayed on my feet, took a savage beating. But um, Floyd Patterson was in attendance, who'd, who'd uh, married an Irish lady from Offaly. He took a great interest in the Irish boxing team because of his warmth and connection with Ireland. So after the fight, he came over to me and a featherweight called Paul Fitzgerald who still lives out in America now, lives in Upper Derby in Philadelphia, great featherweight. He won. So he impressed Floyd Patterson in winning. I don't know what I impressed him with in losing. Maybe my courage, I don't know. Anyway, he came over and he gave us the opportunity to stay on in America. I wouldn't have had the money to come back to America. So I said, yeah, I'll stay. 
I remember phoning my mum. I said, mum, I'm going to stay in America. Oh, son, she said, you'll never come home. I said, I'll be home next year, mum. Anyway, Floyd took us to Gleason's gym. I met Al Gavin and Bob Jackson. And I spied a couple of pro heavyweights in Gleason's gym. A guy called Art Tucker, good pro, and another fella. I can't remember the other fella's name. Gave a good account of myself. Al and Bob said, there's a young heavyweight in the Catskills called Mike Tyson. He's 17, and he's looking for sparring partners. I'd never heard of Mike Tyson. I didn't know who he was. He was knocking men out left, right, and center. He was a phenomenon, you know. But I was just so happy to hear that he was 17 years of age, mm -hmm. same age as me. As a matter of fact, he's seven months younger than me. So when I got to the Catskills with Alan Bob, I was introduced to Cuss and Camille and Manny and Tom Patty and Jay Bright and other people there. Then I met Mike. He was younger than me, smaller than me, and he spoke with a bit of a lisp. Oh, I thought, I'm going to batter you. <laughs> <laughs> I really did the madness of men. Mm. I thought I can't. Oh my god, this is going to be so much fun and easy. And he was so nice because he was fascinated about the Irish history of boxing, and he was fascinated at the time of Barry McGuigan and Barry McGuigan's connection with Mister Eastwood. It was like a father-son relationship, and he had the same relationship because it was like a father-son relationship. And I knew about Barry because Barry had been an Irish hero, a world champion. So me and Mike walked and talked that night, got on great, went up to his room at the top of the house. He had the, the scenery reel of the fights. He had access to the biggest collection of fight films on the planet. Bill Jacobs, Bill, Bill Kane and Jim Jacobs, his management team, his management team, they had the biggest library of fight footage. And um, Mike had access to that library. Now, to me, there's only so much boxing you can watch. To Mike, there wasn't enough. And he used to sit on his exercise bike. He'd go, Joe, man, if that left hook could have landed, that would have changed the whole history of that weight division. And I said, oh, you know, but we walked and talked that night, watched some fights and got on really well. I was actually starting to feel sorry for him, James, I thought. I was he that. lonely? No, he wasn't. He wasn't lonely because he had, he had Cuss, you know, who was like, I I yeah, he wasn't lonely. He had, the, he had Jay and Tommy's two stepbrothers, you know, and Camille and Manny's step-parents as such, you know. Cuss his family, he, he, and it was beautiful. Up, up in the Catskills, Rip Van Winkle was meant to have slept up there for 40 years. It's so tranquil and peaceful. And it's idyllic for a man that wants to train and set his mind on, on what he wants to achieve. And Mike had set his mind on being the champion of the world. Cuss had seen it in him at a young age in the Young Offender Centre. He said, that boy's going to be the champion of the world. And Cuss had already took Floyd Patterson and Jose Torres to world titles. Cuss knew his boxing. Anyway, the next morning, I slept that night, slept really well. The next morning, we got up and we ran, me and Mike, and jogged for about half a mile. Then he took off like a gazelle. And I thought, that's it. You tie yourself out. I'm going to bother you later on. <laughs> right? Came back, had a bit of breakfast, went to bed till midday, got picked up then to go to the to the gym for sparring. And suddenly, these big, powerful men appeared. So I thought, where have they all come from? Like, you know, but I thought, they're all going to box each other, and us two boys are going to box each other, you know. We're on the minibus. They're all very somber. I'm relaxed. I'm so happy. I'm comfortable. I'm getting minded. I'm being well looked after. I've had a great night's sleep, beautiful environment. I'm feeling comfortable with the guy that I'm going to box with, that I think I've got his measure. But these big, powerful men are sitting on the minibus, all like as if they were going to the gallows. But they knew what was coming. Stupid Paddy hadn't got a clue what was coming. You know, I didn't know what this guy was capable of. Got to the gym, warming up, shadow boxing. Cuss goes, okay, bandage up, bandage up, glove up. I'm looking around. Mike's in the ring and he had his shirt off and he was pacing the ring like the lion in the cage when you look at that lion. And he's looking out at his prey and no sparring partners were his prey. And he had his shirt off and the physique on him. James, I've never seen a physique on a 17. I've never seen a physique on a man. Don't mind the 17 year old. <laughs> his neck, his triceps, his biceps, his back, everything was just phenomenal. I hadn't seen him stripped to the waist, you know, and I just thought, there's no way a 17-year-old should look like that. Anyway, Cuss pointed to one of the big men. He got into the ring, got knocked back out. I think the first shot just pulverized him. I do tell people, I ruined a good pair of underpants at that moment. I, <laughs> I shit myself, you know. And I just thought, there's no way this boy should have this power. A couple more got in, and they, they got battered, knocked out. I was number four. So I got in, I lasted three minutes. I lasted longer than the three previous sparring partners. And I got out, a couple more got in. I think I sucked the sting out of his punches and I was back in again. 
eight or eight minutes later, two, three minutes, and two more breaks. Eight minutes later, back in again. Took another three minutes beaten. So I stood with him for six minutes that day. But the madness in me, because I think the box, you've got to have that little bit of madness in you anyway. Of course. Right? And the madness in me, I thought, one of these days I'm going to get the better of him. I never did. I stayed on with him for nearly two years, and he made me cry many times, hurt me <laughs> many times. But it was an honor to share the ring with him. This particular day we sparred, and there was four white sparring partners, which was unusual. Normally, there'd be some black guys. This particular day, there was four white sparring partners. He knocked three of them. I was number four. I got battered. But he didn't put me down. The end of the sparring, he goes, Joe Egan is the toughest white man on the planet. Far, far from it. I was the toughest white man in the gym that day. But mm -hmm. what a compliment from a man <laughs> like Mike Tyson. Uh -huh. But then um, it gave me the confidence and the, 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 the mindset that if I could take Mike Tyson's punishment, I could take anybody's punishment. Mm -hmm. And I got picked. I boxed in the New York Golden Gloves. And I got picked then to box on the New York team against the Canadian All-Stars. Lennox Lewis had won the Canadian title, won a, a bronze medal in the 84 Olympics. Olympics. This was 1985. I've been sparring Mike for a good while. And um, they were struggling to get an opponent for Lennox. I'd been beaten in the New York City Golden Gloves by a guy called um, Sinclair Pap. He went on and he got beaten in the American Championships by a guy called Camulo Doom, who went on to get knocked out on a full international against America and Canada. So they needed Sinclair Pap to fight Lennox and he wouldn't fight because he'd been knocked out by the man that got knocked out by Lennox Lewis. So they were struggling to get a man to fight Lennox. He was the star of the Canadian team. The star of the New York team was a man called Frankie Lyles who went on to win the world super middleweight title. He was the welterweight Golden Gloves champion. Phenomenal fighter. So they said, we've no one to fight Lennox. I said, I'll fight him. They said, Joe, he's knocked out the man that knocked out the man that beat you. I said, yeah, but he didn't knock me out. And I said, I've been taking Mike Tyson's punishment. We've been training in the Olympic Training Centre in Lake Placid. So I was, I was in good shape. I'd been sparring Mike. I was strong. And I said, I feel confident. You know, that's my dad used to joke with me all the time. He said, you always feel confident. I said, yeah, no abundance of confidence. So I said, yeah, I'm okay. Anyway, I got in with Lennox. I got battered. But I stayed on my feet. I got battered. He believes class. You know, height, reach, power. He'd, he'd, he'd every, every advantage over me. But I had courage and I had a good chin. And I took the beating. And I stayed on my feet and I lost on points. And it was it was an honor to share the ring with him. You know, he's 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 a friend of mine. We've we've stayed friends all these years. I I've played chess with Lennox on a few occasions. I've never beaten him a game of chess either, but it's, <laughs> it's a lot less painful to lose than a game of chess. But he's a nice man. And when I was out, I was out doing I was out at the um Klitschko Fury fights in Germany. And uh, we saw Lennox, I was with some of the Irish media guys and some of my friends. And I said, Joe, there's Lennox Lewis over there. We'd love to meet him. I said, he's my friend. I said, we'll never get near him. Look at the security. I said, let me get within earshot. Go within earshot. I said, Lennox. And he's ushered me over. It was like Moses. The security <laughs> just passed. Parted. You know, and he embraced me. Uh -huh. And he's always made me proud. I've had uh, a good friend of mine, Mark Smith, from Bournemouth. Um, Lennox was doing a charity thing for a cousin, for a cousin of his. And um, he was having a, a, an audience with 100 people, train with him, have dinner with him, and they were paying £250 each. He was going to raise £25,000 a number of years ago, £25,000 for his cousin to do something to his gym. So um, I said to my friend Mark, I said, listen, there's an opportunity to go and have a date with Lennox, train with him, eat with him, have the crack with him. So Mark and his mate went down, and he said, I'm in the gym. He said, I'm punching the bag. He said, before Lennox got there, he said, next one, Mark's a big man, Mark's 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, next one, he said, I felt this tap on my shoulder. He said, I look around, he said, suddenly I'm facing the chest. He said, I look up, he said, it's Lennox. The session hasn't started yet. <laughs> and Mark said to me, he said, my God, Joe, he's a beast of a man. Mm -hmm. He's a powerful presence of a man. Mm -hmm. Good set of shoulders on him, good reach. Good, But he was a phenomenal athlete, Lennox, yeah. you know. And he went on, like I said, he got the gold in 88. One of the best, best was, heavyweights of all time. Listen, one of the best heavyweights of all time. The two yeah. men that beat him, the two men that beat him, Rackman and McCall, Oliver McCall and Hassan Rackman, he didn't prepare properly for them fights. There's an old saying, fail to prepare, be prepared to fail. Yeah. When he was fighting them, he was doing a Nelson Mandela publicity tour, God rest Nelson Mandela, and he was making Ocean's Eleven, and both times he got knocked out. When he prepared properly for them rematches, he knocked both of them yeah. guys out. That's, I think people can get complacent, but yes. a lot of these guys, a lot of people think it's natural ability, but when you hear Tyson's story, he was training two and three times a day. He was watching footage at all boxers all around the world. The guy was well educated on the movement, speed. That was hard work as well. How tough was the training then when you were 17 with Mike Tyson? Phenomenal athlete. Mike used to run like a gazelle. And and with boxing, you've got to put the road work in. It's such an important part of the boxing training. Why is that? The road. I think for the stamina. 
Mm-hmm. You know, there's lots of lots of different reasons, I suppose. Getting up early in the morning, dragging. My, listen, my dad used to say to me, I never liked the running. I never liked running. And he used to say, drag yourself out of bed in the morning. He said, it's like dragging yourself off the deck if you ever get decked. Mm-hmm. I said, Dad, no one's ever going to put me down. No one's going to deck me. And I boxed in the Acropolis Games, which was a world ranked tournament. And um, I had a couple of good fights. I'm into the semi-finals. And I'm boxing the Italian. Bo- I beat the Italian, beat the Canadian. Then I'm boxing the Greek. And his name was George Stepanopoulos. And my eye was damaged from my previous fights. And um, I passed the medical because he'd got a buy in his first fight, won his second fight. So if they'd given him another buy, he would have been into the final with two boys. So they let me box. I only had one round of me before my eye closed. My, my left eye closed. Second round, I've walked onto a good shot. I've probably walked onto better, but it put me down. First time on, on my back, out, gone. I was out for the count. And it was exactly like my dad had said. It was like being in bed. I was lying on my back. I didn't know. It caught me. So from the time it hit me, to the time I hit the deck, I was like this, pulling the sheets over me in bed. My two corner men, mm-hmm. Mickey Hawkins and Jerry Hanna, they thought I was calling them into the ring. I wasn't. I was pulling the sheets over me in bed. And I rolled over onto my side, and this eye was closed, and this eye was open, and I saw the referee go five. So for at least 10 seconds from the time he hit me to the time I fell, to the time I hit the deck, to the time I rolled over, I don't remember any of it. I climbed onto my feet. They'd called, climbed into the ring with two corner men. So I fell into their arms. I was beaten on my feet. I lost the fight. I got beat on my feet. But it was the first time I was ever put down. I remember phoning my dad. I said, Dad, I said, uh, I've won a bronze medal. He said, well done, son. He said, that's a fantastic achievement. I said, remember you said about getting decked. It's like being in bed. He said, you got decked? I said, yeah, I got decked. But I'm all right. I got up. I got beat on my feet. I said, I'm okay. My left eye's closed. But I said, it was exactly like you said, being in bed. And I think that's the running, dragging yourself out of bed in the morning to go running on a winter's morning, cold winter's morning. If you can go yeah. through the elements and brave the elements and train and drag yourself over a warm, comfortable bed to go running, that helps as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, not the, just building yeah. up the stamina, but the mindset. Mentally, because when, the, enemy, when, any, when yeah. the enemy's sleeping, you're working, yes. you're grinding, so you're always going to have that wee bit of sharpness and extra step. Yeah. I don't think, is it Anthony or Joshua that doesn't run? No, Anthony would run. Anthony would run. There's one of them that doesn't run, or someone doesn't run. Was it cut? I don't know. I can't remember. I know Nigel Ben likes to do the cross trainer, but I'm sure he still puts the miles in on the road. Every fighter puts the miles in on the road. Robin Reed used to go running at midnight. Mm -hmm. He used to go running at midnight. Everyone has to put the miles in. It doesn't matter what time of the day it is. But I know the early morning runs for a fighter are so important because you've got the fresh air, mm-hmm. you know, you've got the air, the, the, the traffic isn't too bad. You know, if you're out on so the road when you were on the canvas the and you had that count, that's sort of similar like um, Fury and Big Wilder. When he would spark out, he gets sparked right out and then it just, that click moment. Unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Because Do you think that's got a part to play what you're saying, that kind of fighter's mentality, push yourself all those years to... The fighter is the last person to know that beat. Do you understand? That's why you have corner men, doctors and referees that are supposed to be compassionate, thinking with their head. A fighter thinks with the heart. They want to hear the last bell. You know, there's that song, stand up and fight until we hear the bell, stand up and fight, fight like hell. That's a fighter's mindset. They want to hear that final bell. Win, lose or draw, you want to hear that final bell. And... When Fury got hit with that punch, I didn't believe that he could beat Wilder after being inactive and only having them two comeback fights. I really didn't believe. Wilder's punch power, his phenomenal ability, because Wilder has a lot of ability. People don't give him the credit for his ability. He's an Olympic bronze medalist, you know, so he's won an amateur bronze medal in the Olympics, which is a good, good um, apprenticeship for a professional fighter to win an Olympic medal for an American team. Also, his daughter is spina bifida. And in America, you don't have the NHS like you have in the UK. If you haven't got the money in America, you're not going to get the treatment. This country leads the world with the treatment that if you're in any sort of ailment, illness, you get treatment, whether or not you have money or not. In America, if you don't have money, you don't get that luxury. So he works and trains and fights to make sure his daughter is looked after with spina bifida. So he's a man fighting on a crusade. He's like a man on a mission. He's like possessed. Yeah. Every punch he throws is with bad intentions. And he's taken them out in the first round, right through 
to the last round. Yeah. So when he hit Fury with that punch, now Fury's speed and mobility was too much for Wilder. Even only had them two comebacks. I think he fight. underestimated Fury. Listen, everybody underestimated Fury. His engine is phenomenal. He's a friend of mine, Tyson, and friends with his dad, John. His uncle Peter is a phenomenal athlete. But I didn't think he could beat Wilder, not just after having them two comeback fights and being inactive for so long. Yeah. And when Wilder landed that punch, now Wilder knows how hard he punches because he's knocked out great men. He's hit him. Fury was unconscious. The eyes closed. He was unconscious before he hit the deck. Wilder done a little bit of shoulder dance. He was dancing. Next one out of sight of his eye. Out of the side of his eye, he saw Fury open the eyes mm -hmm. and raise. Like fucking, yeah. And it was like, it was like Jesus raising from the yeah, dead, you yeah, know. Yeah. And uh, it was phenomenal how he got up. But not only just got up, right? He got up and went on to the attack. My first pro fight, I got decked in my first pro fight as well. I got decked in the sixth round, but I was tired. And I'd sort of punched myself out in the first five rounds. And the guy decked me in round six. I got up and I held on to my opponent. He wouldn't have got me off with a crowbar. The referee was trying to break us up. I was holding on for dear life. Trying to get my head composure. Yeah. And then I got my composure together. I got my, my second wind and I was okay. But the bell came quick enough. But uh, Fury done the complete opposite to what you're told. When you're in trouble, you're told to hang on, hold on. Fury didn't do that. He went on to the attack. And started hitting Wilder with combinations. How he could even be compass mentos yeah. like that after being yeah. decked and knocked out and got up and was to get so composed so quick. Phenomenal. He won that fight hands down. Oh, he well won the fight. Yeah. Well won the fight. Yeah. Like I've met I've met Deontay, a lovely man. Most fighters are really nice guys. You know, yes, they 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 try to sell a fight, they eyeball each other, they say a few different things to promote the fight. It gets the fans into a bit of a hysteria, and that's building a fight up. But most of the time, the fighters have the utmost yeah. respect for each other, but they've got to sell a fight. See, when you, you know? were fighting with Tyson, 17, 18, 19, he went on to become world champion when yeah. he was 19. Was yeah. there ever a time for yourself, Joe, that you think I could be world champion? No, never. My dad my dad begs the difference. My dad believes that I had the ability. But I think every dad has that sort of pride oh. in their children, you know. But I, I knew my heart and soul. To win an Irish title was a major achievement. You know, that, that to win seven was a fantastic achievement. But no, I never had the ability to be. I wasn't really a good boxer. I was a good fighter. So what was the difference? Were you just tough as fuck? Just I was just tough. That's all I've ever been yeah. is tough, you know. And uh, I've been game, you know. But uh, I never had... My middle brother now, my middle brother Emmett, he could punch. Mm -hmm. And my youngest brother Conley, he could box. But Conley went into the game of football. I was just tough, that's all. Mm -hmm. You know, I never had any sort of height. I wasn't really tall for a heavyweight. Yeah. I never had a big knockout punch for a heavyweight. But I had a good chin, you know, and I was game, you know, and, 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 and I was courageous. See, because you had that reputation at the time of fighting all the big names, never getting put down, did everybody kind of want to spar with you then because they're thinking, I'll get them down? I got I got employed afterwards. After with Tyson, I got employed in America to spar future Tyson opponents. I sparred Mitch Green, Alex Stewart, um, I was just trying to shoot Mitch Green, Carter Truth Williams. So I've done okay. I, I got I got I got employed to, mm. to spar with them and earned, earned decent money. And the money I earned helped shape my brothers and sisters' lives, you know. The longer I lasted with Tyson, the more money I earned. The future Tyson opponents who I sparred with, I earned good money. And I used to ship the money home. Mm -hmm. And the money helped shape my brothers and sisters' lives. Like a sister came out to America. She's out there thirty eight years now. She married a policeman in New York. Mother brother started his milk round, got a milk float, he's doing okay for himself. My sister went to a university to become a chartered accountant. So the boxing with Tyson helped shape my life, mm -hmm. you know, and helped shape my brothers and sisters' lives. So the longer I lasted with Mike, the better my family future was. Yeah, because you went professional. I didn't want to go pro to tell you the truth, James. I didn't, want, I didn't want to be getting hit for six, eight, ten, twelve rounds. Mm -hmm. I was okay for three rounds. You know, I could take anybody's punches for three rounds. I was confident that that you could hit me with a sledgehammer for three rounds. How was that. your your mind then, Joe, getting all those punches as well? I was all right. I was yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was okay. I had a decent defence, and you know, I used to roll with the punches. You know, so uh, it was um, it worked. Mm -hmm. You know, I, was, I never, I never like I said, only one tooth knocked out. Yeah. Never had my nose broke. I got uh, I got lots of cuts. I got um, sixty four stitches after one fight. I was a blood bath of a fight, that oh, was. Sick, yeah. I won that fight. I won that fight. I beat Carlton Headley, went on to beat the Gladiator Raider. That was on um, 
they boy Macaulay's bill, a world mm-hmm. title bill, and had never been to a world title bill, and to box on the undercard of a, a great world champion in the King's Hall in Belfast. And when we were younger, my dad used, we used to watch the boxing on the television and we used to watch the Belfast fans. Here we go, here we go. Mm-hmm. And my dad used to laugh. Look at them Belfast fans with the here we go, here we go. Anyway, I've been in training camp for Mr. Eastwood, who's my manager, with Dave and the other fighters were on the undercard in Beresford House in Queen's Parade in Bangor, eating our food, laughing and joking, going to the gym in the minibus, training together, coming back in the minibus, sleeping, eating, walking, you know, watching TV for weeks before the fight. On the night of the fight, I won the fight. I got cut across the top of the eye, down the side of the eye, across the cheek, across the lip. It was a bloodbath of a fight. And um, I was supposed to go to hospital straight away because they said I needed internal stitches in my eye because I was cut to the bone. But I didn't want to miss the world title fight. So I said to the doctor at ringside, I said, please just patch me up now so I can see the world title fight. And he said, get you up to the to the medical room. So he's taped my face up to stem the flow of blood so I could come down and I could watch the, the world title fight day by Macaulay. And when I come down, Mr. East would have given us two ringside seats for me and my dad. So my dad was standing on the seat. Here we go, here we go. I'm looking at my dad. It's like, oh, the atmosphere's on it. The atmosphere's electric. And next of all, Dave Boy McCauley went past with the entourage to holding his IBF world title bill, belt. And I leaned in and just to touch him as he went by, you know, a great world champion. I was so overwhelmed because of the occasion. Oh. But I'd sat next to him on a minibus for six weeks, <laughs> sat next to him at a dinner table for six weeks, oh. trained with him in the gym for six weeks. But on the night, the occasion was just overwhelming. Yeah. And um, I got to collect an award for Dave. He won the Sports Out of Month Award, and I collected an award for him because he was in training for a, a fight, and it was going on to be the Sports Out of the Year Award. But he asked me to collect his award, and I collected his award in Dublin, a great, phenomenal yeah. champion. Because you went professional, you had your two fights, but you were on a serious car crash. I had, uh, had four pro fights only. Yeah. Um, I didn't, like I said, I didn't really want to go professional. Why? I was happy being an amateur. I was earning, I was earning a few quid sparring. And I was on the doors and I was doing a bit of bodyguard work and I was happy go lucky, you know. And I think to be a professional fighter, you've got to be so disciplined and dedicated and sacrifice a lot. And I wasn't prepared to sacrifice. I was enjoying doing the doors, I was enjoying doing a bit of bodyguard work, I was enjoying doing a bit of sparring. And I didn't want the boxing to be my livelihood. I wanted my boxing. In the beginning, when I started boxing, I thought I'm going to be a, a, a world champion because mm-hmm. every fighter dreams about that. I'm going to make my riches. But I knew at a certain age it wasn't going to be the rich story. So you, you accept that. So you, you make other choices mm-hmm. what you're going to do with your life. And I went down the path of doing security bodyguard. I've done every type of security work. I worked with Delta Airlines and MIS with them, security, um, all sorts of security. And, yeah. you know, I still do that today. What happened? You know, look after the people. car crash. But I was after having a fight in Belfast and, um, Came back to Dublin on, on a coach. My sister had organised a coach for family and friends to come and watch the fight. And when we were coming back, we dropped a friend of my sister's off. He was a doctor, Dr. David Mitchell. We dropped him off around the corner from where the crash happened and um, pulled around the corner. My girlfriend at the time, Lisa Murphy, she went on. She cleared off with that Michael Flatley, the river dance guy was all over the world's news. But she was on the coach and she'd parked a vehicle um, close to where the traffic lights were where we were stopped. So I was saying goodbye to my granddad. Everyone else on the coach was going back to my home. My granddad wasn't, he wasn't going. So I gave my granddad a hug and a kiss. And I said to Tony, the driver, I said, you can drop us off here, Tony. And then the lights went green. He said, I'll save us a walk, Joe. We drop us to the next set of traffic lights. Because I knew Tony, because my sister had organised him for a previous fight. Mm-hmm. And as we're going through the lights, a Mercedes taxi came through the, the other lights, broke the lights, went into a skid, hit the coach. My granddad was going to sit down. He went, he's going to hit us. I've grabbed Lisa around the neck to stop her bouncing off the windscreen of the coach. And as, as I grab her, the coach, the taxi hits the coach. I twist my knee, damage the femur bone in my knee, fall down, smash my jaw, smash my eye, hurt my shoulder. And um, all I remember then is I'm trying to loosen the grip on my arm because I'd had her around the throat. So I must have sort of blanked out for a second. Yeah. And I'm loosening the grip because she, she'd gone unconscious where I grabbed her to stop her being thrown against the windscreen. Then we were all brought to hospital and this was at four o'clock in the morning we were all brought to hospital. The ones that were injured on the coach, my granddad, my brother, a couple of other people injured on the coach, were brought to hospital. Dr. David Mitchell came on duty at eight o'clock. 
and these are all passengers that are on the coach with him up at the yeah, fight the in Belfast. He just left. Yeah. And he says, oh my God, what's happened? And we joke, because that's the Irish humour. Mm -hmm. If we hadn't stopped to drop you off, we'd have been ahead of that taxi, you know. Believe <laughs> <laughs> in Yes, we blamed him. <laughs> but that sort of put me out of action then for a, mm -hmm. for a while, you know. And then uh, finished, hadn't fought for 12 years. And... Um, Got into a little bit of trouble. Didn't know what to do with my life. My life went into a bit of limbo land, James. After the boxing? Yeah, it was over, you know. And uh, That break your heart a bit? It did, yeah. Nothing to focus yeah, on yeah, as much. Yeah. It was, I was 24 years of age, 25 years of age, whatever age I was. And uh, I didn't know what to do with my life. You know, I went into a bit of a depression and um, because my boxing was over. Not just the income, but I enjoyed boxing. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, I, had my, I had my security work. I've always been able to do that. But just my boxing was finished. So I went into a bit of a depression. And then I spoke to Paddy Finn, who'd been the Irish heavyweight champion. His father, boxer Finn, had found my old amateur boxing club. And he said, you ought to retire from boxing because of a trapped disc in my back. And he said, I've gone into the pub trade. I've done okay. He said, he was in Birmingham, in England. He said, uh, come on over and work for me. He said, a couple of years down the road, you get your own pub. So I spoke to my dad. I said, Dad, I said... I'm doing the security, it's means to an end, I'm enjoying it, it's all right, but uh, Paddy Finn's given me an opportunity to come over and work in his pub and learn a trade, you know, and he said, well, it's up to you so much you want to do. So I said, I'm going to do it. He said, I'm proud of you. He said, you wouldn't be with better people. So I came over and I'd done uh, two MVQ certificates. Like I'd left school with two swimming certificates at 800 metres and at 1500 metres, you know, because I didn't really, wasn't really academic. So I'd done two MVQ certificates, I'd done licensee, became the licensee of the Dublin pub. Had that managed that for a couple of years. And then I got the Lindhurst pub in Erdington. Had a big function room, put boxing tournaments on. Uh, me and my business partner took over the pub. And we took the pub from doing a thousand pound a week to doing sixteen and a half thousand pounds a week with the Lions Club based themselves there, with quiz nights, with disco nights, had loads of weddings and it was going really, really well. But then the racketeers, they tried to cash in on um, on your success, the parasites. Uh, we took over the pub in September '97, and um, July '98, the 19th of July 1998, we get a demand for 500 pounds a week for protection money. Otherwise, your pub is going to get destroyed, burnt down. And uh, I thought it was this only happens in the movies, you know. I didn't yeah. think this was this Real was happening life. to me. Yeah. So um, it was the licensee. And there was a bit of uh, bit of tension that particular week, threats and uh, intimidation. And my business partner, um, ex-French Foreign Legion, a uh, Medal of Honor winner, very, very capable, dangerous man, he said, let's bring it to them. And I said, look, my boxing's finished. This is a second chance of making a good life for myself. Let the, the powers to be take care of things. I'm not a vigilante. I'm a businessman, I'm a licensee for a pub. Let the police deal with it. Anyway, the police let me down. Um, on the 26th of July, the following week, I got a phone call to say that these gangs are gathering, they're going to attack the pub. Um, I phoned a sergeant to a no personal friend of mine, licensing sergeant. I said, these gangs are gathering. He said, I'm on my way to you, Joe. He said, I radio the station. I said, I get the men to go up and disperse these gangs in these pubs that they're gathering in. Half an hour later after that phone call was made, there was 37 men in my car park with a hatchet, machetes, a handgun, a shotgun, numerous weapons. I don't know what they had. It was barbaric what they had. And um, there was a pitch battle, 25-minute pitch battle, 55 minutes before the first policeman arrived at my pub and the police station of 400 yards from my pub. The sergeant that I phoned was on his way to me. He got a radio call, a Mickey Mouse alarm call to go to, to the Bromford. Mine was a genuine distress call. And it was a bad scene. It was. They said in the newspapers that it made Braveheart look like a Walt Disney film. Mm -hmm. It was a bloodbath. I took two gunshot wounds. Um, a couple of other people took gunshot wounds. And um, it, it, it was, blessings of God, nobody died that day. Mm -hmm. There was a few came close to death. But suddenly, it's all over again. You know, my, 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 you know I'm in trouble and charged with attempted murder all I done was defend myself self-defense yeah you know. just sense then at that time Joe that was about a bullying comeback that you'd felt exactly you know, exactly all it was was bullying you know mm -hmm. but I do tell people this bullying doesn't just happen in schools it happens in adult life as well mm -hmm. you know I'm a big campaigner against 
bullies. Yeah, against knives and stuff. Knives yeah, and yeah, yeah. Yeah, listen, I've had friends stabbed to death mm-hmm. and it's a horrible epidemic at the moment, this knife crime, you know, and it's got to stop because there's been too many people murdered in the last number of months. Brothers, sisters, fathers, cousins, family, you know, that are suffering. The knock-on effect of somebody getting murdered. These people that inflict this. Yeah, it's a ripple know. effect. It's yeah. the, the victims, even people have to go to court and see photos. Everything that affects everybody. At that time then, Joe, when you get shot twice mm. and you're thinking you've not got a boxing career, how were you feeling then? The lowest point of my life, to tell you the truth, James. Because family worried also. At the end of the day, they're always going to worry. You know, blood, blood, family, they're always going to worry. Even if there's family members that you're not talking to, they still worry about you, they still care about you because you're family, you know. And they were concerned because they knew what I was capable of doing and they were worried that I was going to take the Lord into my own hands after these gang had attacked me. They thought I was going to go and, on the rampage. But I controlled myself and, um, like I said, I was charged. I beat the charges, and um, like I said, headlines in the newspaper, justice prevails. But at the time, my legal fees were running money that I, I hadn't got because the brewery were trying to evict me from the pub, saying that I wasn't a fit landlord because of... Violence. Violence. My fiance at the time, Lisa Murphy, was running around with Michael Flatley, and... Um, so she was messing you about? Oh, listen, it was all over the world's news. Okay. She was living in my house in Ireland. Right, so I had to try and sort out my house. So I had legal battles over my house. I had um, legal battles with the brewery, and I had also legal battles with the the, the, the police being charged. So I sold my watch to my mum and dad. I got me for my 18th birthday. My ring, they got me for my 21st. I sold my car. I sold everything I had. I wasn't getting legal aid to fight all these. You can't fight on all fronts. And um, I was running out of money. And then the guy that was working in the pub, a friend of mine, his sister was caught and this guy to come in, used to drink in the pub, Jack the lad, bit of a Dell boy. We had an old folks home next door to the pub. And we had a man used to come into the pub that turned 100 and 101. He had his two birthdays in my pub, 100 and 100. He used to come in with his son. His son was about 80, right? <laughs> and uh, we had a lot of old people come in from the old folks home. And this guy used to come in, Jack the lad, Dell boy with his file of facts. And I'm like, buy everybody drink. And I thought, what a nice guy. He was a car trader. Anyway, he knew my predicament. He knew I was in a bit of difficulty with money. And he said, listen, he said, I'll give you an opportunity to earn a few quid. He said, uh, let me park some cars in your car park. Could have parked the tank of my car park for all I was getting. He was oh. going to give me some money. Park what you want, right? Anyway, let him park cars in my car park. Turned out to be stolen cars. Um, and suddenly, there's a big conspiracy. I'd beaten the attempted at murder charges, but I was warned that the powers to be wouldn't let it lie. And now suddenly they've they've got stolen cars in my car park of a pub and I'm dragged into this. Um, yeah, I did get the guy permission to park the cars in my car park. Mm-hmm. Yes, I did get money out of them, but I didn't know they were stolen cars. And um, suddenly now I'm up on a stolen car charge, conspiracy. I was offered a deal. Bit of stupidity in me. When you're a kid, you have somebody in a headlock and they say, we give you the draw. Mm-hmm. You got it because you got the beatings at them. So when I was offered this deal, I thought, I haven't done anything wrong. What was it do? Just accept handling. So I, thought, I haven't handled anything. Yeah. You know what I mean? Admitting you'd go. You yeah, I haven't anything. done anything. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and uh, I said, no, no. My business partner at the time was screwed up. He said, Joe, take the deal. Do you know what I mean? He said, they've got you. Mm-hmm. I said, they've got anything. As it turned out, the guy that was... Um, doing the cars he was working with the police and he said I was working with him and uh, they gave me two and a half years in prison and um, they tried to increase it then to seven they eventually increased it to four people were getting slapped on the wrist for stolen cars mm-hmm. I'm going to prison trying to look for him for seven years do you think they try to get you f- yeah of course they did yeah because of yeah of course, of course. Of course. I had to accept pub, it yeah. I had to accept it you know but when when in every boy's eyes his dad's the toughest man on the planet and in my eyes, my dad's the toughest man on the planet. And um, on the day I was found guilty, my dad was up in the up in the up in the gallery. And when I was a little boy, I saw him coming from work this day. Me and my brothers coming from school, and my mum went, "Get up to bed, get up to bed, get up to bed." It was only half past four. Batman was on at five o'clock, so we went up the stairs, and I sat at the top of the stairs. I cradled one of my brothers in his arms, in my arms, and I was panicking because I thought, "What's wrong, mum's mum's a bit." Like, you know, she's a bit agitated. What's wrong here? 
So then my dad came in from work. He was home at this time. And I remember my mum meeting him at the front door and him talking to her at the front door, looking through the banisters, me and my brother. And um, I saw him hold his head in his hand and start crying. And my world just caved in. I got, I got the fright of my life. My dad crying, what's wrong? I'd never seen him cry before. As it turned out, his daddy had died. My granddad had died. And I was too young to understand. I just didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. So all them years later, when I'm found guilty in court, and I look up to the gallery, and I see my dad hold his head in his hands and start crying. And I just felt sick. I felt ashamed. Even now talking about it, James, I feel, it doesn't matter how many times I talk about it, mm -hmm. I still feel sick and ashamed. Then, oh, actually. listen. It, it, it just it makes me feel so low to think that me getting sent to prison had the same effect on my dad as his daddy dying. And I swore then, I said, I'll never, ever get into trouble again, never. I didn't want to get into trouble the first time, but at the, at the time, I was a low, very, very low point in my life. Um, I didn't know I was doing any crime. I didn't know he was parking stolen cars. Um, I just, I was so low, you know, selling yeah. everything out, fighting legal battles. And... Um, but I'd never get, yeah. I'll never get into trouble. You know what, Joe? Everybody needs to kick up the ass sometimes in yeah. life, and sometimes it needs to happen to the bad stuff. It's not the worst of fucking crimes. No. But when you've obviously got that sensitivity and love for your family that they've supported your whole life, so when shit like that happens, listen, we can all get caught up in bad shit. I have many times myself, and I, you never know what's around the corner, but the fact is, for anybody watching, it doesn't pay that life because it's the, 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 the family who do the sentence with you also. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, but you done it. You got out of it. You've been fucking starring in global films all around the world. But what was the like in prison at that time? When I was in, when I was in prison, how did I, you deal with that? It was hard because I'd, 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 I'd made my dad ashamed. I made my dad sad and upset. I'd, I'd made family members ashamed because of I'm suddenly in prison. But they were still there for me. They wrote to me and put money into my spends and stuff. And when I was in prison, I actually saved a man's life in prison. One of one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, prison screws I took a heart attack, and I'd done St John's Ambulance Brigade, so I knew a little bit about first aid, and I helped the man, and um, I got an accommodation from the governor. To, to listen, I wouldn't see anybody suffering. My uncle was, was called Mister Leakes, and uh, I helped him. And uh, the head of security at the time, um, he complimented me as well. And listen. The prison screws didn't put me in prison. They were only there to supervise my stay. Mm. And um, I wouldn't, like I said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I'd assist anybody if I could. And when I was there, I, I, I got fit, got myself healthy, used my time as wisely. best I could. Yeah, wisely, you know. And when I come out of prison, I made a comeback into boxing because I didn't want to get into trouble again. I didn't want to get on a criminal path. I'd never been a criminal. Mm -hmm. um, licensee for a pub. I was in the Irish Army, part time army. I'd, I'd honourable discharge. I was dealt down on FA register, so I'd never been in trouble, you know, done security. How old were you then, here, Joe? When I come out of prison. I think it was 37. Still 37. Young, man. I'm still a young man. I don't yeah. drink or smoke. I take oh. drugs, you know. I'm an Irish man that doesn't drink alcohol. Mm -hmm. People say, what sort of an Irish man are you? Yeah. My dad says, <laughs> my dad says, my failure is an Irish man. But, um, yes, yeah, so I come out of prison and, uh, and uh, I made a comeback into boxing. And there's a big write-up in the boxing news that said, George Foreman, makes the comeback after 12 years. Big Joe Egan makes the comeback. George Foreman makes the comeback after 10 years. Big Joe Egan makes the comeback after 12 years. To get mentioned in the same paragraph mm -hmm. as George Foreman was phenomenal. Anyway, I didn't ring Mike Tyson looking for money. I've never gone capping down to anybody for money. And I said to Mike, I said, listen, if I get fit again, I'm no good to spar with you anymore. I said, but if I get fit, can I get a fight on your undercard? He says, yeah, by all means, Joe. And Shelley Finkel contacted me. He said, Joe, we get your fight on the undercard. I said, well, I'll have a warm-up fight in Ireland. I didn't want to have a warm-up fight in England because they would have said to me, oh, you look great. The Irish will tell you the truth. If you look crap, <laughs> you look, they'll yeah, tell you. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, I'll have a fight in Ireland. Um... Brendan Ingle had a fighter on the bill. My old trainer, John Breen, had a fighter on the bill. There was a few of my old trainers there, a few of my co colleagues that I boxed with. Good crowd, Irish television, great fight. And uh, I fought a friend of mine, good good fighter, Mark Williams. I got him ready for two of his previous fights, he had two wins. He hadn't fought for two and a half years, I hadn't fought for 12 years. We had a good tear-up, you know, and uh, fifth round, it dislocated his shoulder in the fourth round. I pushed him into the corner and his arm came out. He came out for round five to fight. Anyway, the fight was stopped. But it was still a win, 
Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't the best of wins, but How it was did a that win. Make you feel, Joe, after all that time. Listen, to get my arm raised, you know, you're only as good as your last fight, you know, and to get my arm raised in that particular fight, which turned out to be my last fight, mm-hmm. because. I got back into training. I contacted, asked John Breen, Brendan Ingle, how did I look? They said, you looked okay, a little bit rusty, but you looked all right. So I contacted Mike. I said, Mike, I'm okay, a little bit rusty, but I've had a win. I'm ready to box on your undercard. I'm back in training now again to go to America, to fight in America on Tyson's undercard. And I'm training with my friend, Steve Dawson. I trained with many, many times. I'd sparred with many times. We'd, we'd work the doors together. We're sparring this particular day. I'm leaving the house. I'm staying with him. His little boy Tristan said, what are you doing today, Big Joe? I said, I mean, I tell you, you're going to box today, Tristan. He said, who's the toughest? And I said, oh, your daddy's the toughest. I said, by a mile. Anyway, we sparred. wasn't even a good punch. I had the headgear on, I ducked into it. And I, my, I felt the blood running down my face. Mm-hmm. I was 38 years of age. I felt the, the blood running down my face. I felt the rib open, the skin split. And I knew at that moment in time it was over. You just know, because it wasn't even a good punch. Mm-hmm. I went to the hospital, done a many stitches to put in my eye. I go back to the house. Tristan sees my face a bit swollen. And he goes, what happened, Big Joe? I said, oh, your daddy cut me when we were sparring. Oh, you said he was the toughest. I said, oh, I did I said, oh, yeah. But I knew it was over, you know. But I'd won my last fight. Was your family at your last fight? Who was there? Oh, I can't remember to tell you the truth. There was, a, there was a, a lot of family and friends there, yeah. It was only, you know something? I'd forgotten what the fear was like, James. I'd boxed in this hotel. It was the Burlington Hotel. I'd boxed in the Burlington as an amateur, and now I'm boxing as a pro, and I've since done a dinner with Mike Tyson in the Burlington Hotel. Right. And the Delta Airlines crew used to stay in the Burlington. There was a nightclub there called Annabelle. So I, was, I had a great, great, I knew the Burlington Hotel. It was only 10 minutes from where my mum lived. But when, when you box, you get a fear. It's like butterflies in your stomach. And George Foreman was doing a video called Champions Forever with Joe Fraser, Larry Holmes, Muhammad Ali, Sonny Liston, not Sonny Liston, Ken Norton. These great five champions talking about their experiences. And George Foreman said he was fighting Ken Norton. He said he's looking across the ring and he sees the specimen of a man chiseled. He said, the finest look of man, he said, you could imagine. He said, I walked to the center of the ring. He said, Ken walked to the center of the ring. He said, I eyeballed Ken. Ken eyeballed me. He said, I was so glad Ken didn't look down because my knees were shaking. <laughs> and I thought, George Foreman, one of the greatest ever champions of all time, saying he was scared. So I remember my first pro fight. I'm at the weigh-in and I'm looking around these big guys. I think, oh God, I hope it's not him. He's got his tattoos and I hope it's not him. He's got hairy uh-huh. chest and just macho looking men. And I've gone into the doctor and my heart was racing. The doctor said, you're nervous. I thought, Stevie Wonder could see I was nervous. I was terrified. I said, yes, doctor, I'm nervous. He said, well, I've just examined your opponent and he's twice as nervous. I thought, happy days. <laughs> but I forgot what the fear was like, yeah. you know, 12 years out of the ring. On the day of the fight, when I used to box, I used to come into Irish music, but because of what happened with Lisa and Michael Flatley, I didn't want to come into Irish music. So on the day, I'd, I'd spent the day with Steve Dawson's girlfriend at the time, Anna, picking some songs to come out to. And we picked the Fuji's, ready or not, here I come, you can't hide. Mm-hmm. And I thought, what a great song to come out to. There's no hiding place in the mm-hmm. boxing ring. I was nice and relaxed, done my sleep, had my bit of pasta, carved up. I felt good. I'm in the dressing room, Darren Corbett, the Commonwealth champion, comes in. He goes, Joe, it's on the back page of the Daily Mirror. I'm getting my hands back, I got my hands over the back of the chair. I'm in good shape. Darren comes in, he goes, Joe, the guy you're fighting in the next room, screaming, Joe, go, ah, put the fear of God into him. I start laughing. Bit of a nervous tension laugh. Mm-hmm. I'm looking at Darren anyway. That picture was on the back page, me laughing, right? Next one, they said, okay, Joe, let's check your bandages. To check my bandages, to stamp my hands, to make sure that the bandages are satisfactorily done. Glove up, glove up. They said, right, walk from the dressing room to the ring. The fear kicked in. <laughs> Terror. <laughs> right? I'm like, oh my God, what am I doing here? So long out of the ring, have I got anything left? You start questioning yourself. So I walked from the dressing room, and I walked to the ring. It was on Irish television. And I walked past the steps to the ring. And I was walking out of that building. A couple of old geezers went, Joe, you've missed the steps. They tapped me. I went, what? They said, you've missed the steps. If they hadn't tapped me, I'd have walked right out of that building. I'd have been at my mum's front door. <laughs> telling them, knocking on the door, there'd be a mum. And I turned around. I went, oh, yeah. And I walked back and I climbed into the ring. Now, for the first two rounds, I wasn't there. He was 
hitting me with every yeah. sort of shot. And I went back after the second round, I'm in the corner, and my trainer, Tony Man, my old amateur trainer, hit me a slap. Like, if it wasn't being hit enough, wake up. He's bothering you. Wake up. Mm-hmm. And I come into it in round three, round four, started to get the better of him in round four. But then his shoulder came out. It was stopped in round five. But like I said, it was a win. Victory's a victory. Yeah, victory's a victory. But it is um, it is a hard sport. Mm-hmm. You know, and there is a fear element that you've got to overcome. You know, definitely. And, I think uh, that's kind of kept you sane and gave you that kind of work ethic and belief because no matter everything you've went through, Joe, you've ended up acting, acting now. How yeah, did that well, end up is, coming the about? The thing is, like I say, um, I did a dinner with uh, Joe Fraser. I mm-hmm. sparred Mike for the Marvis Fraser fight, and Ken Purchase and Charlie Hale had given me a chance. My boxing was over. I come out of prison. My boxing was over again these guys gave me a chance. During the acknowledgements in my book, the top, top acknowledgements in my book, Ken Purchase and Charlie Hale, I'm doing this dinner at the Hilton Hotel in London. I'm sharing the top table with Joe Fraser, Marvis Fraser, all these great champions. And Cass Pennant was in attendance. My nephew knew who Cass was because he's a West Ham fan and Cass published books. And people say, are you not afraid to talk? I said, listen, if you can climb into the ring and box, nothing in life will faze you. Mm-hmm. You know, there's two spellings of the word fear. The coward spells it, forget everything and run. The boxer spells it, face everything and rise. Yeah, that's good, that. And that's the boxers. It's the first I've heard you know? that. But it's fact, you know, there's nothing in life will faze a fighter. So I said, yeah, no problem talking. So I done the talk. Cass Pennant was in attendance. I knew who he was. I was introduced to him earlier on in the evening, half joking, half holding earnest, I said, you might write a book about me. He said, let me hear what you've got to say tonight. And he went, spoke, he took an interest in me, went to his office the next day, phoned Mike Tyson, who was in Brazil at the time, put him onto the phone to Cass, he said, anything that my brother Joe needs, he said, I'm there. So Cass said, right, we got Mike involved, we can do a book. I got a man called Ronald Graham, who was Matthew Vaughan, the movie director's godfather. Matthew Vaughan was Guy Ritchie's original business partner. And uh, went down to Hastings, spent a lot of months down in Hastings talking about my life. And then he was making recordings. Then uh, he'd done a book, he wrote a book. And the book was launched in Canary Wharf. Mike Tyson launched the book. It brought Canary Wharf to a standstill, thousands and thousands of people. I know everybody was there for Mike Tyson, Mm -hmm. but Mike Tyson was there for me. And it was one of the best days of my life. Mm -hmm. And... um, Cass then gave me a part in his movie. He had a movie called Cass about his life, and he gave me a part in his movie. I met an actor when I was on the film, said, who, who, who I knew of, he was an ex-boxer, an actor called Tam Hassan, who have since become great friends. And Tam has said, Joe, you've got a great presence on screen. Do you not fancy an acting career? I thought to myself, well, I've acted my way through a boxing career. <laughs> I'll, give, I'll give it a go. You know. So I said, yeah. So he introduced me to his agent, and his agent sent me down for the first Sherlock Holmes film to play a character called Mac Murdo, to fight Robert Downey Jr. So the casting agents have said, look into the camera lens, give an intimidating stare, say this intimidating line, and we see how it goes. So I've gave the intimidating stare, I've gave the intimidating line. They went, wow, you've got an amazing intimidating stare. I said, I've had to look into the eyes of Mike Tyson and Lennox Lewis <laughs> to try and intimidate them. To intimidate a couple of casting agents is no problem. Anyway, Got the part, went along to the read through. My nameplate, Joe Egan, next to Jude Law, Robert Downey Jr., Rachel McAdams, Eddie Marson. I said, I'm Guy Ritchie, Joe Silver to see our Warner Brothers. And the guy said, Joe, I've been trying to get you in one of my films for a long time. I said, You're joking. And Robert Downey Jr. leaned in. This is Iron Man. And he goes, Joe, you come with a fearsome reputation. I can't believe these people even knew me, mm-hmm. but they knew me through Tyson. Anyway, we travelled down in the minibus to do the practice fight, and Guy said, how are things, Joe? I said, things are okay. Guy, I'm making ends meet. He said, has your agent told you much again for the fight scene? I said, Guy, I never even asked. I'm just so honoured to be in your film. When he told me, James, more than I've got any of my pro fights, I was deadly serious. I said, Guy, for that money, I said, Robert Downey Jr. can really hit me. You can <laughs> kick me as well if you want to. And he took a fit of laughing. He said, Joe, I don't want you to be beaten up. I said, Guy, I've been beaten up a lot less. I'll do a few weeks in hospital mm-hmm. for that money. Then I didn't have to get beat up. I get into the prison scene that wasn't in the original script. I get called Big Joe by an Academy Award with an actor in a Warner Brothers movie directed by Guy Ritchie. And it's made my mum so proud because no mother wants to see her son being beaten up. You know, she sees me killed in the films all the time. But she, knows, <laughs> she knows it's not real, you know. And um, yeah, the parts have gone 
from strength to strength. They're getting bigger now. Mm -hmm. I get to play the gangster or the tough guy, you know. it's I've had to live that life as mm -hmm. a tough guy, you know, being a boxer. Yeah, you played the part real life. Yeah, I've, I've had to live that life. So they, they, they say it's all about believability, yeah. you know. I'm not saying that I, I look like a hard man, but I can walk like the hard no, man. You, because you do, Joe. You, you do. walk into the ring, you walk into uh -huh. the ring, you yeah. walk in as a man. Uh -huh. You know, you walk mm -hmm. in. Well, now women are walking in. They're walking in as hard women. Yeah. You know, you're a mm -hmm. hard person to get in a fight. It's phenomenal, mate, how you know? well you've done. I think you, sometimes you probably don't realise it, but through your career and what you've done, mate, it's, it's unbelievable. You should be proud, and I know your, I'm your proud family will I'm I'm definitely proud. Because really. I've seen a video, you took Sugar Ray back to meet your mum as well, oh, and yeah, she looked yeah. buzzing. She looked... When I met Excited. Ray Leonard first, when I met Ray Leonard first, we were in the Catskills and Mike Tyson adored Ray Leonard because he said that when he was in the Young Offender Centre, Mike was a shy, timid boy. The only thing that brought him out of his shell was when a bully boy ripped the head off his pigeon and killed his pigeon and Mike ferociously attacked this bully and then suddenly unleashed. The beast. The beast, right? Mm -hmm. And then he was inspiring because in the Young Offender Centre Centre trying to get the aggression out, got him at the boxing. And one of the, the officials in there at Box Pro, a fellow called um, um, oh, Stuart, some Stuart, and he contacted Cuss. And Cuss came down and saw this 14 year old boy and said, This boy's got the potential to be the heavyweight champion in the world, 14, 15 years of age. Cuss adopted him. We were sparring this day, and Ray Leonard had come to the gym. And Mike, when Ray Leonard visited the Young Offender Center, mm -hmm. um, Mike stood offside. All the older boys were getting the attention with Ray. And then as Ray was leaving, he seen Mike sitting over in the corner and he made a beeline over to Mike and embraced Mike. And Mike never forgot that. He said, I always had this affection for Ray Leonard because he came over to me, wouldn't leave without coming to see the young boy on his own. That's the, the testimony mm -hmm. to the character of the man. That Ray Leonard is a thorough gentleman. Mm -hmm. Also one of the greatest boxers ever, the grace of boxing. Yeah, with. definitely. And... Um, when Ray came to the Catskills to see Mike spar this particular day, Mike put on a ferocious sparring session and destroyed us. Destroyed all the sparring partners, destroyed us. Mm -hmm. Physically battered us. He wanted to impress Ray. So I've gone back to the guest house, gone back to the Costas house. This is a lovely story, this is. I was I was in a bad way. I was crying this particular day, really bad. I was swollen up, I was busted up, because Mike had busted up us in front of Ray. And Mike came to my room and he came with Jay's stepbrother and Tommy's brother. And he didn't come into gloat. Like, we're only teenagers. And teenagers can be quite cruel to each other. Mm -hmm. And he didn't come into gloat. And he come in, I was crying on my bed, swollen up. And he said, Joe, man, he said, there's no need to cry. We know you're homesick, but we're your family now. I wasn't crying because I was homesick. I was crying because he was after yeah. bathroom me. <laughs> anyway, I just got an affection for him that day. I thought, he's, he's mm -hmm. a lovely young man. Even, mm -hmm. even though you're getting beaten up yeah. by him, he's still a lovely young man. Anyway, months later... Ray Leonard came to the camp again and he came over to me and he said, you were here the last time I was here. He said, you're a very brave young man to come back. I said, I haven't been anywhere. He said, you've been here taking these bits. I said, yeah, it's one of these days to get the better of them. Anyway, me and Ray hit it off. He came back to the guest house that day and I said, Ray, will you say hello to mum? He said, mum's here. I said, no, she said, no. And so I phoned my mum and I said, mum, I said, Ray Leonard wants to say hello to you. So I put her onto the phone and I said, one day, Ray, you'll visit my mum. And he did. He mm -hmm. came to Dublin to visit my mum. Mike Tyson's been to visit her. He's visited mm -hmm. her a few times, Mike has. Mm -hmm. And it's great, you know, to yeah. walk through my hometown with these great champions of the world. But even better to say they're my friends, it's mm -hmm. better, you know. I've yeah, got a friend. Got some friend, friend list there, Joe. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But you're very well respected. You're very well liked. I put a post out, you're coming on. Everybody was buzzing for it, happy because they've heard your stories and they couldn't wait to hear it. So it's. Uh, I got on well with people, James. Yeah, you know, there's no arrogance or attitude yeah, about me. Yeah. And I pride myself on my manners. People can see, and people can see that. So just before we finish up, what was Cuss like? Oh, Cuss was lovely. Very, very nice man. Mm -hmm. You know, he was a walking encyclopedia in boxing. You know, he had, um, he had, a, he had a great, he had, he, had a, he had a lovely way about him. I remember the first day, the first day I was there. Now, every household has different rules at the dinner table, right? My dad never liked us having elbows on the table. Mm -hmm. and he didn't like us talking when we were eating our dinner. So everybody's household has different rules. So Camila's brought out this soup, right, like a, a, a vegetable broth. So I took a spoonful of the soup and I went, oh, Camille, this is gorgeous soup. Cuss sat back, put his spoon down. Everybody went silent. Everybody sat back. He goes, Joe, he said, I've often heard of a woman being called gorgeous, but never a soup. 
<laughs> and they started laughing. Mm -hmm. And it was just a it was just a beautiful laugh. Mm -hmm. And I thought, these are my kind of people, because I love laughter. Yeah. You know, there's hundreds of languages in the world. Everybody speaks different languages mm -hmm. and nobody really has a clue what anybody's saying. But we all laugh in the same language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And laughter's contagious. You cry, you cry alone, the mm -hmm. world laughs with you mm -hmm. when you laugh. Yeah. And I just got on great with him. He's a very, very nice man. Mm -hmm. You know, it was tragic to see him die before Mike had won the world title. Mm -hmm. That would have been would have been nice one. But he instilled, he spoke to me about mental mental courage. You know, because sometimes fights can be won or lost before the first bell rings. You know, there can be a little bit of intimidation with boxers. They can psych you out. It's all psychological warfare before yeah. the first punch is thrown. And Cus gave me the mental you know, mindset that, 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 that I can withstand yeah, yeah. this sort of psychological warfare. Because you met Muhammad Ali as well. Yeah, I met Muhammad Ali four times. I was honoured to be in that man's company, privileged and honoured. To me, he's not just the greatest man to enter a boxing mm. ring. He was one of the greatest men to enter the world. Boxing was blessed to have him. He could have turned his hand to any, any sport. You know, he was just a supreme athlete and a kind, decent man. Mm. And... My dad had met me, met him before me. I used to envy my dad that he'd met Muhammad Ali before me and just the fact that he'd met him because mm -hmm. I used to do an Ali shuffle as a tribute. But I, I, I idolised Muhammad Ali, yeah. you know, and to me, he's just one of the greatest of all time. See, I think he is the greatest of all time, not just because of the boxing ability, but because of outside the ring, his presence. Phenomenal. And um, the stuff, the other work that he did and... The fact that he didn't want to go to war as well showed that. Proved that that proved war was that, the wrong war yeah, to meet him in his war. And he was right. And they punished him afterwards for that. But I went to his home. I went to his home to meet him in his home in Michigan. Al Capone used to own his home. And to go through his gates, G-O-A-T, greatest of all time, G-O-A-T. Mm -hmm. And then to meet him in his home, I've met him at the Alley Centre. I've met him at, in Louisville. I've met him in Washington, D.C. And I've met him in New York. I've met him four times. And just to be in his presence, you're in the presence mm -hmm. of greatness. But cuss used to speak to Mike about Muhammad Ali and Mike, Mike idolised Muhammad Ali as well because you speak to any fighter or any manager on the planet, Muhammad Ali's going to come up in conversation. Mm -hmm. He is, like I say, one of the greatest, if not the greatest of all time. But Cus helped me with the mindset that psychological warfare and one of the best wins in my career, James, I'd fought, I'd been beaten at Atlantic City before when I fought for the first time against America. Years later, like I said, at Fort Lennox, I'd been sparring Mike and now matched with Bruce Selden. I was on an Irish team again and he was the number one in America, one of the top heavyweights in the world. He went on to win the world professional heavyweight title and it was a hard fight because I knew what he was capable of doing, but I knew it was tough. Anyway, the first round, I got battered. I got smashed to bits. I got back to my corner. My two cornermen want to retire me on my stool. I said, I'm not quitting on my stool. Winners never quit and quitters never win. I'm not quitting on my stool. I said, I can take this punishment. I've took it off Tyson. I've took it off Lennox Lewis. I can take this punishment. I've come out for round two. Selden couldn't believe that I was coming out for round two. You know, he'd after destroying me in round one. The bell went. I was entitled to hit him. I couldn't get near him in round one. He was so fast and graceful. Phenomenal boxer. Mm -hmm. But I was allowed to hit him. The bell had rung. I hit him a body shot. I connected with a good body shot. Bang! sunk it in and it slowed him down then I could get to him then and I went on to win the best fight of my career because he went on to win the world heavyweight title and after the fight I have to go to the hospital I'm all busted up even though I'd won but there was 10 great champions in attendance we were introduced to them on the day it was Jake Lamotta Rocky Graziano Joe Frazier Jersey Joe Walker Sandy Sander Billy Conn Vito Antifirma Floyd Paris and Chico Vija and I think Alex Aquara there was 10 great world champions in attendance we were boxing in their honour Anyway, Jake Lamont of the Raging Bull was fighting the fight outside of the ropes. I didn't know what was happening outside of the ropes. I had enough problems inside of the ropes. But he tripped and he hurt his arm and he cut his eye. I didn't know about this. I'm in the back of the ambulance, ready to go to the hospital. The adrenaline's wearing off. I'm in a lot of pain. I'm thinking, what's the delay? Seldom hasn't been hurt that bad. He's not going to the hospital, even though I'd beaten him. He wasn't hurt that bad. Next one, I brought Jake Lamont of the Raging Bull to the back of the ambulance. And he looked at me and he goes, the heavyweight, great fight kid. Best anesthetic, James, I've ever had. The pain was just lifted off me. The raging bull complimented me on a win. And we became friends that day. Years later, when my book came out, Jake Lamont did two book signings with me. He did a book signing in Doncaster and he did a book signing in Carlisle. And it's on my DVD. 
and one of the greatest champions of all time and would be interviewed by the BBC. Anyway, the DVD is called Joe Egan with the toughest mm -hmm. man on the planet. There's over 30 world champions. And the man that made the DVD is filming this, this day, the interviews with Jake LaMotta. And they said on the BBC, Jake, you and Joe, friends a long time. Liam Galvin is the man that made my DVD. He's a good friend of mine, fantastic guy. And um, he's filming us. And they said, Jake, are you and Joe friends a long time? He said, me and Joe go way back. He said, Joe was like me. Joe would fight anybody. And I thought, what a great compliment from the Raging mm -hmm. Bull. But then he goes, but he wasn't so fat then. <laughs> and then, I, thought, I thought, I put a bit of weight on. Like, but uh -huh. Liam goes, should I leave that on? I said, I don't care. Mm -hmm. I'm not vain uh -huh. or egotistical. But... Um, what a lovely man, Jake yeah. Lamora. Some amount of names you've mentioned there, Joe. Yeah. It's phenomenal. And like I say, greatness attracts greatness. So it says a lot about yourself, mate. So going forward for the future, where's big Joe Egan see himself? I'm enjoying the acting. Mm -hmm. I'm still doing my security work, but I'm enjoying my acting. I work for a company called Ambi, the Ambi Medical Group. I look after the owners of the company, uh, mm -hmm. Sandy Patel and Shailesh Ravel. I look mm -hmm. after both of them. Um, and I'm ambassador for the company as well. And... Um, I enjoy that. That's like my, my, mm. my, my bread and butter as such. The acting is a bonus and I do a lot of after dinner speaking as a bonus as well. But I'd like to be able to one day maybe be a full-time actor, mm -hmm. just go from film to film, a TV series to TV yeah. series and uh, quit the security work. But it's getting there. You know, the parts, like I said, are mm -hmm. getting bigger. I'm enjoying my life. I've recently signed the rights to my book to be a film. Mm -hmm. So fingers just crossed to get somebody... I mention that there. That's some film you've yeah, got there, Yeah, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed to get somebody good-looking, James, to play me. In well, the... I'm always open to there you, mate. You've got my yeah, number, there you, go. <laughs> there you go. You're a handsome man. You're a handsome man. But, um, Would you play a part like yourself? Do you know something? I'd do a cameo role in it. Cause when they Definitely. Made, yeah, yeah, when they made the movie Cass, mm -hmm. Cass did a cameo role in it. His similar story is to mine with Mike Tyson mm -hmm. and me. Cass had the same similarity friendship with Frank Bruno. Yeah. And uh, the West Frank, Ham boys, yeah. Aren't they? And then Cass and Frank did a cameo role in the Cass movie. Cass was played by an actor called Nonso Anusi, phenomenal star, and Tamara San. And yeah, I do a cameo role in it. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd, I'd love that to be made because to walk a red carpet with my mum on a premiere of a Big Joe movie that's all I want to do. Mm -hmm. And hopefully. You know, she hasn't been in the best of health of recent, but she's getting back. Mm -hmm. She's okay. Fight it yourself then. Yeah, she's she's beaten a few strokes and mm -hmm. um, she's in a care home now in, in, in Ireland. But um, she's okay being over to visit her yeah. now. She's, she's getting, I said to her, I said, Mum, I said, all your life, I said, you looked after seven children, you've looked after a husband and you've looked after grandchildren. Now you're in a care home, you're getting minded, mm -hmm. you know, and, and she's getting the best of care. And she's a visitors and, mm -hmm. and any chance I get home to visit. And I send her home the DVDs. Yeah. She watches the films and she loves them. And she has our colleagues and our friends in the care home uh -huh. going and watch the films. With her. But that's that's the big dream. Plans now. and the Yeah, yeah the, the, do you know what? The yeah. acting, I'm loving the acting, yeah. James. You know, and the parts, like I say, are getting bigger with experience. Mm -hmm. And um, they're just trying to sort out a director yeah. now for the Big Joe movie. And the old joke is you've made your mum proud your whole life with yeah. your stories. And you might not realise it because you've lived it. It's not the same. But I definitely, you, that, that film would be a smash hit. And I can see you down the red carpet doing doing your thing with that film. So, Joe, listen, you're a great man. And for even coming on today and telling your story and meeting me today. It's a pleasure. It's phenomenal, mate. And uh, you really are. A, you're a good soul, brother. And I wish you all the best for the future. Thanks very much. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Thank, Thank you. you.